Hello, I'm Deacon Greg Lawton, the Minister of Spiritual Formation at the First United Methodist Church of Jackson, and this is your Food for Thought for Friday, November 6th, 2020. The Gospels tell us that people often ask Jesus for a sign or a miracle. They were amazed by his healing touch, his multiplication of a few fish or bread loaves into a feast for, for many, his transformation of water into wine, and how he tamed the storms at sea. Spiritually, we like these kinds of signs because they astound us. They help us think beyond our everyday moments of life. They might also help us see how God is greater than our worldly needs. But Jesus also taught that what the everyday world needs from us is the fruit of our faith. I'd like to talk about how we are known by our fruit. When Jesus was challenged by Pharisees who claimed he was doing all these signs and wonders through demonic but not holy power, he responded that a tree is known by its fruit. Earlier in Matthew's Gospel, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his followers to beware of false prophets who come looking like one thing but who are actually another thing. He says they will be known by their fruits. In other words, we can trust people by their actions. Metaphorically, we could say grapes don't grow from rose bushes or figs don't grow from thistle. Good trees bear good fruit, and you can tell by the fruit whether the tree is good or bad. The beautiful thing about this image is that Jesus doesn't care what kind of fruit we produce, whatever your talents, skills, or callings might be, but he does care that the fruit we produce be good, healthy, and fit for use among the people of God. We all produce fruit. We all have things we can share with others and improve their lives. A few years ago, I was working with some young farmers and learned something that seemed amazing to me. They were leading a grafting workshop on the, and someone noted that for some fruit trees, you don't have to graft a scion of the same kind of tree under the rootstock of the host tree as long as those trees are compatible. In other words, you can graft a peach branch onto a plum tree and that branch will produce peaches. Several kinds of citrus fruits can be grown from the same tree. This can be a great advantage for farmers who want a variety of produce but don't have acres and acres of trees to grow them on. It also helps in cross-pollination. Now I realize this may seem to counter what I just shared about a tree being known by its fruit, but stay with me for just a bit. In John chapter 15, Jesus calls himself the vine and his followers the branches so that we can all produce good fruit together. Since no one is born directly into Jesus' family, the only way to become part of that family, the only way to become a, a branch on the Jesus vine is to be grafted in. And when that happens, we continue to bear our own fruit. It's our fruit we produce on this Jesus vine. But the quality of our fruit increases because Jesus is the rootstock. And the better the rootstock, the better the quality of the fruit. When, you're, when Jesus is your rootstock, the quality of your fruit is much better. In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul takes a moment to talk about the fruits of the Spirit and their opposites. He lists nine fruits. And they are inclusive of the best parts of life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What a great list. Typically, when a biblical writer shares a list like this, the first one is the primary one, the one to pay attention to most. This list starts with love, and it's no wonder. All the other things hang on having a loving attitude. Without love, Paul says in a different letter, we are noisy even when we try to do good. So all, other, all, all of our other fruit depends on the level of love we show others. And the flavor of our fruit deepens when we can love many different kinds of people and not just those who share our backgrounds or experiences. In God's orchard, there are many kinds of fruit trees all comprising a satisfying harvest. This list includes a, several 
fruits of the Spirit, several things we might consider, but I want to lift up two of them today. We have a problem with patience right now in our culture. We are tired of living in a COVID reality as the pandemic lingers on and grows and there is no clear end in sight. We're tired of having to follow procedures and protocols that keep us and others safe. We're tired of being told what to do and what not to do. We're worried about our own health and the health of our loved ones and what will happen if we get sick. It's wearing us down. That's why patience is a fruit of the spirit. Patience calls on us to wait to see what God is up to, to bear all things in love, and to live together in hope for a new reality. We're also impatient with our election process. As I record this, I still don't know who will be our president in January. And it's hard for us. We're used to knowing on election night who to expect to take office. And we don't know. And it's drawn out. And we're frustrated because we don't know and we're concerned about the fate of the country and who's, who will lead us. And again, that's related to patience and waiting and watching and seeing what will come and then responding in faith and love to those results. On Sunday when we gather for worship in the sanctuary and virtually, we will share our financial fruit in the form of pledges related to the gifts of our labor or savings, the fruit of our generosity, so to speak. When the Jews had sacrificial offerings in the temple, they were encouraged not to just bring part of the harvest, but the first fruits of it. This meant the early gleanings and the choicest quality. They were instructed to give to God first and foremost, and trust that what remains will be enough for their use. It will be sufficient to live on. Now that is a strong statement of faith. It's relatively easy to look at our income and decide what portion we might want to give to the church after we satisfy all of our other bills, after we pay the car payment and the mortgage and the rent and insurances. We usually look at all those big items first and then decide what we might give to the church based on what's left. Because it sounds risky to live the other way around, but that's what people are called to do, to give first and trust that the rest will be enough. It's a statement of faith. I hope you can join us on Sunday, either in the sanctuary or online. There'll be a moment in the service when we'll be asked to meditate on the portion of our income we might return to the church and then bring forward that pledge for prayer. And if you're participating at home, you can let the church know of your intent during the week. But I want to be clear, the focus of this or any worship service, the central theme for each time we gather, isn't about money. It's never about money. It's about how we live lives of faith before a generous and abundant God. May we know this to be true. May our lives show it. And may it be so for each of us and all of us, whatever our fruit may be.